This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 115, another Wisdom Wednesday with Jason Burak. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja Wisdom Wednesday. Today's show is a little bit different than our regular Wisdom Wednesdays. I am joined by Jason Burak from Wall Street for Main Street to discuss what's going on in the markets. Jason does fantastic economic and market analysis at Wall Street for Main Street and I'm excited to talk to him about what's going on and what is behind the market record highs that we're currently seeing. Jason was a guest on episode 102. If you haven't listened to that episode, I would highly recommend it. Jason is an investor, entrepreneur, financial historian, Austrian school economist, and contrarian. Jason co-founded the startup investor education and financial education company, Wall Street for Main Street, to try and help the people of Main Street by teaching them the knowledge, skills, research methods, and investing expertise of Wall Street. Wall Street for Main Street is now transitioning to an educational technology company that will empower people to learn a practical, real-world, useful financial education at an affordable price using the new virtual classroom software technology. Jason feels that this will help make sure that people are better prepared to navigate through these difficult financial waters. The Dow 20,000 parties are going bananas, and at the time of recording, it is surging towards... 21,000. The S&P is also at record highs. The S&P is the stock market index that measures the performance of the largest U.S. companies. Now, one of the most important benchmarks in measuring whether stocks are overvalued or undervalued is their price to earnings ratio, also known as the P.E. ratio. And over the last 100 years, the long term average of the S&P 500 price to earnings ratio has been in the 15 range right now it's run about 26 and a half which is almost 75 percent higher than the long-term average has been over the last 100 years since the 1870s there's been a total of three periods in which the average stock price to earnings ratio was above 26 and a half. The first time was around the panic of 1893. The second time was the 2000 dot com crash. And the third was around the 2008 financial collapse. To say we have a bubble on our hands is to say that Tom Brady and the New England Patriots Super Bowl comeback this year was just okay. Debt is also at record levels, whether it's national, state, or provincial, cities, towns, municipalities, families, individuals, auto, student, credit card, you call it, debt are at record levels. Global trade is also slowed down a little bit and is currently trending towards the lowest levels since the last financial crisis. A fantastic blog that I highly recommend is Simon Black's blog at SovereignMan.com. And Simon Black wrote about another major indicator of the stock market for him is something known as the Buffett valuation. Now, the Buffett valuation looks at the total value of the stock market relative to the country's GDP, the gross domestic product. Warren Buffett has called this ratio probably the best single measure of where valuations stand at any given moment. Right now, for example, uh, Simon Black writes that the total size of the U.S. stock market, according to the Federal Reserve data, is around $22.6 trillion. While the total size of the U.S. economy is roughly $18.8 trillion. So this puts Buffett's valuation at around 
meaning that the stock market is about 20% larger than the entire U.S. economy. Historically speaking, this is very expensive, Simon Black writes. Stock markets start getting into trouble when the ratio surpasses 1. The Buffett ratio was 1.11 before the 2008 financial crisis and crash. There's also another great article on the Wolf Street discussing how the S&P 500 earnings are stuck at 2011 levels, yet stocks are up 87% since then. So every indicator is screaming that we have to proceed with caution. But I have seen many of the same warning signals for the past 12 months, and this bubble has not deflated, but instead it, it has actually been filled with more air. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at CashflowNinja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at CashflowNinja.com or texting Cashflow Ninja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. Have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Are you interested in real estate investing and don't know where to start or how to get the results you want? For valuable information, to get you started, visit Join Ops Properties at joinopsproperties.com. Globally, coffee is a $90 billion industry, and International Coffee Farms offers a sustainable income opportunity through offshore sustainable agriculture. You can own a parcel of your very own cash-flowing specialty coffee farm in Panama. For more information on this income opportunity, you can download your free report at cashflowninja.com forward slash Panama. Listeners of the Cashflow Ninja can also grab a free audiobook download from Audible when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free audiobook download at CashflowNinjaBook.com. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, MC, I'm glad to be back so quickly. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so many things happening. And, uh, you know, while a lot of folks are having their uh, Dow 20,000 parties and champagne is popping and at different places, I felt the need to dive into this a little bit and uh, take a little bit of a closer look to see what is really going on. And uh, you've done some fantastic work just analyzing the markets from a big picture perspective, um, as well as doing a little bit of technical analysis. So uh, thank you for joining me today to just uh, talk about this for a little bit. Sure, no problem. So I came across an article that was basically talking about how Dow companies from the Dow and Jones Industrial um, reported the worst revenue since 2010, yet the Dow is over 20,000. What are some of the reasons that you can see that uh, we've, uh, we've crossed it at that stage? And obviously, feel free to talk about uh, if there's any whatsoever correlation of actually earnings and companies doing fantastic things and the economy with this market. Well, for, first of all, welcome to Dystopia. So we have almost 20 trillion in debt for the U.S. government. We have uh, almost tw we have around 20 trillion now total value for all the S&P 500 companies combined, and we have 20,000 Dow. And like you mentioned earlier, I, I think a lot of this there's really very little, if any, fundamental reasons for why the general stock market, especially these large cap stocks that really have no revenue growth, is going up. Normally, when you're paying a, a high multiple on a stock, you're paying for growth. And let me give you some uh, examples here. So I have Coca-Cola up right now, uh, which is symbol KO. Today, by the way, for your listeners out there, today is Thursday, February 23rd, 2017. So obviously when this is released, the numbers will be a little bit different, but the, uh, the themes will be the same. So Coca-Cola, which has very little, if any, revenue growth, is trading at almost 28 times earnings. Tra uh, tra trailing 12-month multiple on the P.E. ratio. It's forward P.E., Ratio, uh, assuming that they can grow the revenue a little bit, is is just a little bit lower. Uh, I, I would say that the uh, <laughs> Coca-Cola stock is not known for growing the revenue. They've been doing tons and tons of acquisitions. Uh, you sent me this article from uh, Wolf, uh, Wolf Street, which he does good analysis of the stock market and the real estate market. Uh, but I could go on and on about a lot of these large cap stocks. Large cap stocks, though, a lot of people, and this has, doesn't have anything to do with fundamentals, 
the Federal Reserve and these other central banks, because of manipulating interest rates, have chased people with financial repression into chasing income. I hear this all the time from people who listen to my podcast, and we have a very large audience, uh, not as large as yours, MCs, but pretty large. Uh, lots of our listeners out there who have a job are looking for extra sources of income, and you know, in the past, they could have found it in other less risky investments. They're chasing these things higher in stocks. Uh, there is a much higher... Uh, P.E. ratio on utility stocks, uh, the utility stocks, which have really no revenue growth at all, but they have a dividend. Uh, people are paying 22, 23 times earnings for a utility stock uh, in this market. So I could go on and on with the different examples of companies, uh, large cap dividend stocks that are overvalued. People are chasing the dividend desperate for any income. It's a, It's very, very scary out there. Now, let me talk about some of the reasons why I think the stock market is going high, and it's not based on fundamentals. So if the market was was behaving normally, there would be revenue growth, there would be growth in free cash flow, there would be new products and services, there would be investments in property, plant, and equipment. And to a large extent, this is not really happening across the board now. There's problems in corporate governance with a, large, with a lot of large-cap multinational stocks. Uh, the incentive structure in place for a lot of CEOs and board of director members and upper management is really, really bad. And there's an earnings beat game where basically the earnings can be manipulated or manufactured to beat earnings for three or four quarters in a row or maybe even two years. And then the executives at the company can walk away with a golden parachute, even if long term the company is riddled with debt. They've done share buybacks or really, really bad acquisitions using cheap debt that in the long term are going to hurt the company. But I think the stock market, MC, really has rallied uh, since Trump surprisingly won the election based on a number of different factors. I would say some of the main ones, though, are there was a lot of very big Wall Street money like George Soros and others who were betting, uh, who were shorting the stock market, and we had a big short squeeze. So when Trump won... After the election and then the inauguration, the market didn't crash like a lot of people expected it to. And so a good amount of the people who were short have started to cover some of those shorts. So that's been piling on. That has nothing to do with fundamentals. Another reason is hopium. So uh, rather than looking for undervalued companies that are actually growing revenues, that are growing free cash flow, that are growing earnings the right way instead of, you know, with financial engineering or, uh, or other bad accounting tricks, uh, what, we have, what we have now uh, is we, we have a hopium where a lot of people are betting and paying up high valuation and high multiples that Donald Trump can fix the economy. Uh, so I don't want to, uh, a good long-term investing philosophy is not hope and pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I think buy and hold, long-term buy and hold MC with large cap dividend stocks, uh, maybe if instead of bonds or something, or you already have a successful business generating cash flow, or you, uh, or you already have rental property income and you're looking for a little bit of diversification, you can maybe find some halfway decent deals occasionally, but I would not be allocating lots of capital into large cap dividend stocks at this point. I would be waiting for a crash on the downside. Some of the other factors, though, why I think the uh, stock market is going higher than we rationally think, I think the stock markets, MC, are pricing in devalued currencies all over the globe. So when we see these central bankers try to manipulate their currencies and their exchange rates, and basically everyone's doing it. You know, on TV, we hear Trump saying China is a currency manipulator, blaming China. The U.S. does it just as much as China. Uh, the U.S. had a quote-unquote strong dollar policy under uh, Bill Clinton and Robert Rubin, who's sec uh, Secretary of Treasury, a long time ago. It was a strong dollar in name only. Uh, they were, you know, printing lots of money and devaluing and giving out bad loans and creating bubbles and things like that. So uh, it wasn't a really strong, no central banker, no one running their treasury department, no head of a country's politician wants a strong currency. Uh, we see this most in the currency markets where the volatility, I think a big theme for 2017 MC is going to be that uh, whereas in the past a 1% or 2% move per year in currency exchange rates was considered volatile and a big move, we are seeing 1% to 2% moves MC now in currency exchange rates in, in a single day. Sometimes we are seeing them in a matter of minutes, okay? During the Brexit vote, when it looked like uh, Brexit was going to win, there was over a 5% move in the British pound to the dollar. 
And uh, in 2016, the, uh, right after Brexit, the 12-month move, the British pound moved 14% against the dollar, which is a record move down. Uh, so, And to add, this year we've seen the dollar against the Japanese yen move a lot. Uh, one of my uh, listeners to my podcast who I'm friends with texted me. I wasn't paying attention to this because obviously I'm only uh, one analyst here at Wall Street for Main Street, so I can't pay attention to everything. But he sent me a message that the Australian dollar uh, earlier in the week moved 5% in one day against the U.S. dollar, and then it it reversed a couple hours later. So it moved 5% one way down, and then I, maybe the Central Bank of Australia came back into the market panicked that the exchange rate was moving so much and moved it back. So the, we're in unprecedented times for that. I think another reason that the stock market is also increasing so much is besides all this currency that's being flooded into the system, and it's not just the U.S. because China's on a dollar peg. So anytime the U.S. increases the base money supply, China has had to increase it lots too. So there's lots of flight capital based on a global economy that is getting worse and worse the last few years. So they can come out with these government data and statistics saying jobs numbers are good, GDP is good. A lot of this is phony. I, there's very little honesty in these government manufactured numbers, unfortunately. So uh, the reality of the situation is that things are not doing well in a lot of different countries in the global economy. And I think a lot of the politicians whether they're you know global elites in China or billionaires in China or people in Brazil or people in in uh, Europe or Africa, they've been moving money back into the U.S. and they've been parking money in the stock market or in dollars or in treasuries as a uh, safe haven because U.S. capital markets they have better pro private property rights than many other countries and it's just viewed as more liquid in the safer market. So those things again that I just mentioned, some of those examples, really have nothing to do with fundamentals and the underlying, you know, company like uh, some of the companies in the Dow actually, you know, running their business soundly, growing revenues, and the market paying a reasonable multiple for that. So uh, I, I think going forward, because there's going to be uh, more more stagflation, I expect in the United States, and I think it's going to filter out to a lot of other economies. I think we're going to see a lot more volatility in the stock market, and I think there's going to be opportunities there to trade a lot of these markets, whether they're uh, ETFs, which are exchange-traded funds. And rather than picking a direction, I think there's going to be, or, or trading the VIX index, which is the volatility index, I think that index is very manipulated uh, because uh, people, the, the plunge protection team, uh, the exchange stabilization fund, there's a bunch of different Federal Reserve, there's a bunch of different groups in the U.S., uh, along with the Bank of International Settlements, who pay attention to certain key markets and try to prevent things from crashing too much. I think the rules of the game changed a lot after 2008 when Lehman Brothers failed. Uh, they saw that there was too much counterparty risk in the system with the derivatives market. So letting you know a big bank like Deutsche Bank going forward totally fail and allowing you know capitalism and bankruptcy and free market forces, I think a lot of the people in power, whether they're Keynesian academics or they're running some of these global one world government type of uh, overseer uh, organizations, they don't really believe in capitalism that much unless it's like corrupt fascism or crony capitalism, where uh, you know with the TPP and other things. So uh, I, I think you know the stock market. Rising has very, very little to do with fundamentals. Oh, the other thing I wanted to bring up was these high-frequency trading computer algorithms. So uh, I have a lot of friends on Wall Street. A lot of them have been longtime traders. They made a lot of money. And, you know, since I've been doing my podcast for years now, I've developed these good contacts. And some of them have been coming to me lately and telling me how little human beings are actually left on trading floors at the New York Stock Exchange and so many other exchanges. And so what we have a situation here now, whether it's intervention from central banks or governments trying to protect key markets and prevent markets from totally collapsing, we also have these trading algorithms where, for example, if a, a stock or an index uh, drops below its 200-day moving average, which is a key technical indicator, if you're a very rich, affluent hedge fund or an investment bank and you have billion dollars or more to play with, you can have these really sophisticated trading computers and algorithms you know, that trade in the nanosecond, and you can plug into the algorithm that if this stock or this index crosses below its 200-day moving average, which is a bearish signal, 
you could say to start shorting this thing massively with massive amounts of leverage. So you have things piling on. And with the stock market, uh, what we've had is, you know, basically a painted tape, I would say. So with the intervention of certain key groups, whether it's S&P 500 mini futures being bought by the Plunge Protection Team, the Exchange Stabilization Fund, whoever, whichever one of the groups, these guys are aware of how these trading algorithms work on Wall Street and how so much of the daily trading activity now I'm seeing is not done by human beings. It's done by these algorithms with programs. So they can trick the people in power who the central planners are aware that they can trick the algorithms into basically doing whatever they want and extending a trend, either bullish or bearish. So I think that's another reason why the uh, stock market hasn't crashed yet is because it seems like every time the technicals in the stock market get a little bit weak, something comes in and buys the dip, you know, a not-for-profit. Uh, there's been a lot of buying in, uh, in S&P 500 minis futures at illiquid hours of the stock market, either right before the stock market closes at 4 p.m. Eastern time or in the after-hours market or, or very early in the morning uh, before the market's even open when you and I are sleeping here in the East Coast. Uh, people are buying massive amounts of S&P 500 e-mini futures contracts and moving the technicals that way when things look bearish. So uh, when you add in these factors, you know, these don't have anything to do with Main Street and growing a business, uh, and the stock market just continues to go higher and higher. There will be, though, I think, MC, some type of uh, breaking point. Uh, right. I, I don't want to say when it will be, but for your listeners out there, you know, there will be trading, op uh, obviously not long-term buy and hold investments for large cap dividend stocks in the Dow. I would not be accumulating here. But if you want to buy a call option uh, that, you know, this rally can go a little bit longer, you can do that. And then you can buy a put option uh, with it at the same strike price and you would have a volatility trade set up that's hedged. So there's options there. What what you can do then is once you have those types of profits, you uh, a profit going with some volatility up or down, either on a, a large stock in index, an individual company, or an ETF, you can take that money off the table and go buy a better asset rather than just doing the stock trade. So I think that's what's uh, what's being set up here for trading and uh, why the stock market is rising. And uh, hopefully I've laid out a pretty decent case for why very little of it actually has to do with real fundamentals. No, you make it... Uh ton of really, really good points. And one of the things that you touched on, too, was the financial engineering that's going on. And, you know, obviously, there's a, you made a very, very strong case for that. One of the things that I'm looking at, too, is the psychology, because there was a lot of people that, as you mentioned, uh, they look at it from a, a point of hope. Uh, that Trump is going to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to, to do the things that's necessary yeah. to improve the, the economy. A thing that I've noticed is he, you know, before he was elected, so candidate Trump was talking about this huge bubble in the stock market. And actually, after he got elected and he's in now, he quite frequently points out how well the stock market is doing. And I understand that he's trying to boost confidence and, you know, playing into that whole psychology of, of, of the momentum that, you know, any president that comes in has. He's has been a little bit different for many different reasons, which is an en entire another podcast. But, um, that could, something like that could come back a little bit to bite him if this does, uh, if there's a huge correction on his watch. Yeah, I agree. He's acting like a politician already, you know, a hypocrite. He's, because we know he was pointing out the truth, the populist argument that the Federal Reserve, we, he said it in the second debate against Hillary Clinton that the Federal Reserve is manipulating interest rates, that the stock market is a bubble. A lot of people agreed with him on that. And they thought he would focus more on, you know, trying to fix the real economy and create jobs. And obviously, he's only been a president now for a little over a month. So it's still pretty early. I think he's actually done a decent amount of his campaign promises. He's scaring, you know, the mainstream media and the Democrats like crazy with his Twitter handle, and they're making up lies about him uh, to a certain extent. Uh, but it's, it, it's, 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 it's worrisome how he's taking credit now for the stock market. Uh, you know, I don't think he's going to allow interest rates to rise, though, MC. Uh, I think, you know, he can put three new Federal Reserve Board of Governor members on. There's three empty seats. So uh, there's a lot of people wondering who he's going to put on there, if he's going to put 
someone who's in favor of a gold standard, someone who likes Austrian school economics, someone who's more free market economist, who's not, you know, an academic ivory tower, PhD Keynesian economist that's guilty of groupthink. Right. Uh, because uh, you should maybe have Daniel DiMartino Booth on your show soon. Uh, she has this book out called Fed Up. She was an insider at the Federal Reserve for eight or nine years, and she was one of the few people working there who wasn't an ivory tower academic PhD economist. She worked on Wall Street. She had a finance background, and so she actually had real-world experience. She had market experience, and she said, like, almost all the people at the Federal Reserve, they have hubris because they have so much education. They all have PhDs in, in, in economics, so they think they're smarter than everyone else and that they can plan things and pull this lever and that lever and fix the economy. They believe in their economic models even though the reality of these predictive models in so many instances, MC, are absolutely horrible. The real-world track record of these predictive models, these are the same predictive models that said that Donald Trump didn't have a chance to win the Republican primary. They said that Donald Trump wouldn't win the uh, election over Hillary Clinton. They were giving him almost 0% chance to beat Hillary Clinton. The predictive models also said uh, that there was zero, almost zero chance that real estate prices would fall prior to 2008. Right. So, uh, and yet they cling to these models. So they're guilty of myopia, groupthink, hubris, uh, herd mentality, confirmation bias. And these are the people who are making the key decisions. So uh, Donald Trump hopefully will do the right thing and he will put uh, three people who will dissent and argue and sabotage the uh, Keynesians at the Federal Reserve from doing more damage. But, um, you know, he, it seems to me he wants to spend more money. So he's he hasn't gotten his tax cuts passed yet, but he still wants to spend. So I, I can't see him wanting higher interest rates if he wants to spend that much more money. No, absolutely. And I agree with what you're saying. A lot of these Ivy uh, Tower professors, I mean, they sit in echo chambers and they become delusional at a point. I mean, Paul Krugman is a pretty good example of that. When you start making statements that it'll be really great for the economy preparing for a stage alien invasion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you really start to, 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 to get a little bit delusional because everybody, of course, in that atmosphere, as you know, you know, they're going to tell him how smart and how wonderful and how brilliant he is. So there's no pushback um, on them. So I, I really do hope that he gets someone in there that's going to challenge a little bit of the, the groupthink that exists at the Fed. You're listening to Jason Burak on the Cashflow Ninja podcast. We will be right back after a word from our sponsor. International Coffee Farms is a real estate-based specialty coffee farm ownership opportunity. You can own deeded, half-acre parcels in title, already operating specialty coffee farms in Boguete, Panama. They are turnkey managed professionally on your behalf by a team of local experts with sustainable average income of 12% and with cash flow beginning in 12 to 15 months from the date of your parcel ownership. International Coffee Farms' mission is to own and operate specialty coffee farms in Boguete, Panama that are economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. As part of this mission, 20% of the gross profits of each farm goes towards a socially sustainable fund to improve the lives of the coffee farms farm workers and their families. International Coffee Farms currently owns and operates eight specialty coffee farms in Boguete, Panama, with parcels available for immediate ownership. To find out how you can become a parcel owner, you can download your free income opportunity report at cashflowninja.com forward slash Panama. You're listening to Jason Burak on the Cashflow Ninja podcast, and now back to our interview. The other point that I wrote down to to ask you about was the share buybacks of companies uh, on the stock market. I mean, it, we've had record share buybacks over the last couple of years um, with all these companies taking on a ton of debt because interest rates are so low and then buying back their own shares to prop up their stock prices and then eventually, you know, get, get, to get the executive bonuses that a lot of these guys get for taking the company's uh, stock price in a certain direction. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so we've had record amounts of share buybacks since 2009 and record amounts of leverage buyouts in the last few years as well. And this is a, another thing when you have artificially manipulated interest rates and cheap debt, uh, you know, this is going to lead to more investments in robotics and automation too with artificially uh, suppressed interest rates and cheap debt. So when politicians who don't know any economics are trying to force higher minimum wages across the board, you're going to see uh, retail, you're going to see restaurants make investments in touchscreens and 
and robotics as well. So, uh, you know, the, there, there is huge, huge consequences that the people in power, I don't think they fully understand this, uh, are doing. Uh, the share buybacks, though, you know, I, I think that has to do with corporate governance. I think there's huge problems in the corporate bylaws there. A lot of shareholders, unfortunately, don't really don't don't even really vote. So if you own a lot of shares, very few shareholders as a percentage, when I talk with a lot of publicly traded companies, they don't even mail in votes. So they don't get their voices heard. Uh, normally, it's pension funds or mutual funds that are large block shareholders of large cap companies that control the voting blocks. And the incentive structure is the problem. So you have the, the government creating and central banks creating artificially cheap debt. And then the people, the corporate governance laws that have been written and the board of directors have allowed this ridiculous corporate, uh, this ridiculous incentive structure. What they should do instead is this is this is how things should be changed, in my opinion, is that for the executives creating new products or services, creating long term ca free cash flow growth and new products or services and growth over five year, 10 year averages that's when you should get your options bonuses and things like that not beating earnings one uh you know every single quarter and that kicks in so after two or three years you can load the company's balance sheet with debt and you know long term the company's uh in major major trouble the company stock price is going to crash but you don't care because you're the ceo and you beat earnings and you trick the stock analyst to lowering the revenue guidance and the and the eps guidance and so you're going to leave with, you know, tens of millions of dollars in bonuses a couple years from now, and you don't care what happens long term. So that can be fixed uh, at each individual company. There's just not much of an effort right now to be doing that. So, uh, you know, people should go out there and you can complain to uh, large shareholders of your company. If you're a shareholder and you could say you have to put a new incentive structure in that's for creating new products and services, more real investments into the company and long term free cash flow growth rather than share buybacks. But, um, you know, that's something that people on Main Street could do. I don't think the federal government should force that. So I don't want to see broad, you know, legislation like uh, Dodd-Frank or Sarbanes-Oxley, because in a lot of cases, you know, the uh Regulatory cost for this is so expensive, and a lot of these things don't even work really anymore. So I would rather see a grassroots free market uh, approach to that, saying how uh, the management's interests are properly aligned long term with the interests of their employees and their shareholders to create win-win-win scenarios. Uh, I've thought about this quite a bit. There's unfortunately, MC, not too many companies out there like that. And, uh, you know, the large cap companies are the most guilty of this because they're so myopic. And uh, Wall Street puts a lot of pressure on these guys. Uh, most people don't understand this, but if you're uh, an executive at a large publicly traded company, so if uh, you have literally investment bankers calling every day asking you if you need to sell more shares of stock, if you want to take on more debt to do more deals. So, uh, you know, offering you almost easy money, almost free money, very cheap money to do these things. So, uh, you know, until the uh, the executives either say no to all the people making the phone calls or uh, the Wall Street banks can't borrow money that cheaply to offer uh, the large cap dividend uh, companies these types of deals, this thing's not going to change quickly. But, um, you know, I, I outlined the plan that I would like to see long term where uh, people aren't getting huge uh, bonuses, uh, huge stock option packages, uh, huge salary increases for just beating earnings for a quarter or two. I would rather see, you know, the transformative big leap forward where we created a revolution. We spent five years or 10 years or 15 years on research and development. We created a new product in a new industry, we created, you know, tens of billions of dollars in value for the economy, or we created that next trillion dollar industry. I would rather see more of that than uh, what's happening right now, the rent-seeking and parasite behavior. Uh, and it's not just from corporate executives, man. There's parasite behavior going on pretty much across the board at all the key economic and political power positions. No, and, and the one thing that makes me a little bit nervous is that if Trump does repeal some regulations, like, for instance, the Dodd-Frank, and then a, cor a sharp correction or a crash does happen, that there would be a lot of Keynesians blaming this crash or correction on the lack of regulations again. Yeah, I agree, but that's going to happen no matter what, though. The Keynesians are always going to blame, you know, they have, they have, they're more like a religion, okay? So Keynesian economics, Marxism, these things are 
basically a religion. You know, what we have now is we have a bunch of academic uh, economists who cling to their models. They say, but the model said this, like the model right now, uh, even before Trump took office, is predicting three to three point five percent GDP growth for the United States for almost 10 years going forward. It's totally ridiculous. OK, we're not going to be anywhere near there. Uh, even even if you totally removed inflation to zero, the inflation rate is actually higher than three to three point five percent in the real economy. So in order to have real free market capitalism, uh, free markets or real capitalism, there has to be some bankruptcies. OK, people either uh, like in 2008, when they were selling fraudulent mortgage backed securities, they have to go to prison for fraud. We have plenty of laws on the books. We don't need any more laws. People think, oh, we need to add all these laws. There's already too many laws. There's already tons and tons of laws on the books. The problem right now is that a lot of these laws are not being enforced. So if you or me commits a minor infraction, we're in trouble. But if you're a CEO of a, a if you're CEO of a billion dollar company, you can hire expensive lawyers or talk to the right government regulator or bureaucrat and get off your charge or pay a fine and not admit any guilt. Or if you're a you know, very high-ranking politician like Hillary Clinton or something, you can get away with almost murder. So uh, the problem here is not that we don't have enough laws. The problem is we have good laws. We probably have too many laws and should start removing laws and regulations, but the laws are not being equally enforced now. So if we remove Sarbanes-Oxley and the others, there's still lots of laws on the books for fraud and other things where people should go to jail for. But in order to have a healthy economy... We have to have, you know, bankruptcy. We have to have where people who made bad decisions and bad investments, they get penalized and someone who was more cautious and prudent gets a chance to buy the assets at a lower price and restart. And that's how the economy was successful at that. But we have people who, as a religion or ideology, are totally against that now. And they're in power. So, and they're making a lot of the key decisions. So uh, we have an ideological war and an information war going on. And, uh, you know, I think, unfortunately, things are going to get worse before they get better, even though Trump, I think, is better than Hillary Clinton. But uh, it's such an enormous mess right now. Uh, you know, even if Trump is there eight years, I don't think he'll be able to fix very much of it. The other thing that I also noted and, and to talk about, too, is the baby boomers. You know, we have a generation of 76, almost uh, clo around about there, 76 million people that's going into their golden years. And um, with the required minimum withdrawal uh, rules on the books from the from qualified retirement plans, a very large chunk of these boomers in 2016 and in 2017 are started to withdraw from the market as their force at age 70 and a half to do that. And there's really no place for them to put their money. If you look at what, you know, a money market account or safer investments would pay right now that they know of. Do you think there's a, there's a lot of capital coming out of those plans and then back into the market? I don't know if it's coming back into the market. People are going to have to spend it because they want to keep their lifestyle. They don't want a declining lifestyle. Uh, I think what's going to, I think, you know, the argument, I don't know if you're making this argument or not, but it sounds like it's going down the path of, you know, Harry Den and demographics and, and Robert Kiyosaki uh, also predicted this in Rich Dad's prophecy that there would be a demographic sell-off of asset prices. And that's what would accelerate a crash in asset prices of homes and stock market because the, ba uh, the baby boomers would have to sell to fund their lifestyle, and my generation, Generation X and the Millennials, wouldn't be able to buy. Uh, what they are not accounting for, though, is how easy now it is. Basically, it's, it's just entry on a digital keyboard for central bankers to create trillions of dollars in free currency units and give them to hedge funds or investment banks or other people to go and buy assets. And what we also have now is a situation where other countries are printing as well, like China and Japan and Europe, European Central Bank, and they're buying up, you know, assets like corporate bonds. They're going into the stock market. Japan is a very large owner of Japanese ETFs. The Japanese Central Bank is. And uh, so we have a situation where foreigners in other countries are looking, are looking and saying the U.S. is still safer. So if you're a rich Chinese uh, businessman or rich Chinese political figure, and you made a lot of money over in China for whatever reason, either honest or, or dishonest, illegal, maybe stole money, and you started buying properties in the United States with your money, 
You've started buying properties in London. You've started buying properties in Vancouver and Toronto. The numbers are reflecting this. So the argument that the demographic cliff is going to guarantee that, that the asset prices crash in a digital debt-based fiat currency system where look how easy it is for the central bankers to create digital currency units and money uh, and credit, basically a keyboard stroke, people aren't, aren't thinking like this. So, you know, during example, during the 2008 crisis, we found this out from the Freedom of Information Act. The Federal Reserve was able to give basically an interest-free loan to the European Central Bank for $10 trillion. <laughs> for $10 trillion. And That's this nuts. is to prevent you know, Deutsche Bank from going bankrupt because they're worried about the counterparty risk in other European banks. So in a system like that where basically they can create that type of money at will, if all these baby boomers and there's a demographic cliff want to sell their assets – well, there's going to be a buyer. The buyer is not going to be a normal person uh, who would come in like me uh, who may have saved up money to go buy a house or saved up some money to go buy stocks. They're going to be people with access to the money trough. And this has to do with Austrian school economics and the Cantillon effect. And Richard Cantillon, he wasn't an economist per se, but he survived uh, the Mississippi bubble and John Law. And so he saw when there was going to be just enormous bubbles and what they look like. So he survived two bubbles. I think he survived the – you should go up uh, – if you're interested in history of economics, go and read about Richard Cantillon. He survived John Law's Mississippi bubble in France and also the South Sea bubble. So he knew what bubbles looked like and how people who were connected to you know key members of business or key members of the government were getting basically free money and credit, and then they were going out and buying assets. So, uh, you know, as long as uh, they can keep basically giving away credit to people on Wall Street or people in D.C., we're going to have crazy fluctuations in asset prices where rationally, you know, they should have crashed because there's no real free market buyers or very little and we would need a lower price. But as long as the central banks are creating, you know, all these currency units devaluing the currency and people don't realize it because the currency is not hitting the real economy – it's it's not going to act the way the market would supposed to. You would think, right? And to your point, the the housing inventory from the the, the crash in two thousand and seven, two thousand eight, two thousand and nine was swallowed up by hedge funds and Wall Street. Yes, so, yes. So the same and thing- mortgage backed securities too. And so that you know all those garbage toxic mortgage backed securities. I think you know money was printed off, or the, those guys were given almost interest-free loans to buy them and start trading them to make a market for them. So they were given a huge incentive to go out. They were given all this free capital to start trading it. So they basically almost couldn't lose on that trade. So look at how the rules. This is this is rule number one for me. So you think because of demographics that everything has to drop? Well, look at the central bankers and the politicians on Wall Street change the rules on you. No. So it's we're, we we have it's it's. It's not a, uh, you know, you're a sports guy like me, so the goal, when you kick a field goal and the ball's up in the air, it's not fair if you move the goalpost <laughs> while the kick's already. You're, you've cheated. But that's, that's what I feel that the economic and political elites are doing. So every time we kind of have a grasp on what we think the rules are, they go and change them again. And unfortunately, this is what I see going forward. Yeah, and staying on bubbles too, I mean, in the beginning, there's kind of like a stealth phase too where the smart money moves into an asset or a vehicle and then it becomes more aware. There's an awareness that spreads around and institutional investors come in and then you kind of like have a nice little up, upswing and in, in the price of the, of the asset. And then you start getting into the mania phase where the media starts paying attention to this, pumping it up. There's yep. enthusiasm. The public's getting nuts. And the next thing you go into the greed phase and that's when, <laughs> that's, yep. that's when the, uh, you, you know, you have, um, People quitting their jobs and trading technology stocks like in 1999, right? So <laughs> exactly, and and dancers in Florida buying three investment properties, you know, no it, cash, it, it, right? Yeah, yeah, no cash, exactly. And then it turns into the delusion phase, um, and then that's where kind of the the wheels fall off and uh, it corrects back. So. I don't know. Where, where do you think we kind of are at now? Are we kind of in the greed or de- delusion or uh, phase? We're in the greed mania phase now. I mean, things can go, as Von Mises would say, I think we're in the crack up boom now for the asset prices because the asset prices, you know, I've been saying this for years now. I, uh, 
I, I didn't think the stock market would crash prior to 2015. From 2009 to 2015, I thought the stock market would go up, but I was saying it was for zero fundamental reasons. Just as I was getting from my learning more about how the financial system really worked and talking to a lot of the different sources that I've compiled this information from, especially about the currency swaps. Once I heard about that and what they were able to do, at you know the overseers at the IMF and the Federal Reserve and the Bank of International Settlements, uh, even China's gotten into the currency swap game too. Now, now they're, China's not doing the currency. The People's Bank of China, which is China's central bank, they're not doing the currency swap game at the hundreds of billions or trillion dollar or tens of trillion dollar level like the Federal Reserve is doing at doing it at. But China's doing currency swaps with their trading partners in the billion dollar level. So they're providing basically these billion dollar interest free loans to their trading partners. They have over 35 of them with different trading partners, whether it's Egypt or Venezuela. Uh, and, you know, they can use these things to uh, curry extra political favor to get beneficial contracts on natural resources. So, um, you know, it looks like things are going to get even crazier before we get back to uh, rationality and allowing market crashes. <laughs> Well, it's definitely a very, very interesting time that we're living in. So thank you for all the points that you made around this, um, <laughs> trying to uh, make sense of it, this with me because, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there wondering what is going on because um, I think uh, it, it just, you know, most people that I speak to look at it and, you know, they uh, – they don't see that anything has really changed in the fundamentals um, and just doing a, a fundamental analysis of where we are in the economy, the, the debt load of governments, uh, local governments, estates, individuals, and so forth. So um, it's, a, it's been a blast having you on again, Jason. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can my listeners um, learn more about you and uh, follow you and listen to your podcast? Sure. Uh, they can go to our main Wall Street for Main Street website and sign up for our email list of W-L-L-S-T-F-R-M-A-I-N-S-T. -S uh, we also put our interviews and we've done over 500 of them with a lot of different experts on different topics on iTunes. And our YouTube channel has over 2.5 million views and over 13,000 subscribers. But now YouTube is censoring our channel very heavily. And we are going to make about $7,200 in annualized revenue from YouTube for their YouTube ad program, and they just took it down to zero, basically, uh, because they don't like our message. So I'm trying to provide people with honest opinion and information, interviewing a lot of quality experts, uh, whether they're talking about infinite banking like you or they're talking about stocks or commodities, and uh, YouTube is uh, censoring me and sabotaging my channel and penalizing me for it. And staying on that topic, that's happened to quite a number of people out there uh, into Austrian economics and with a different message. Yeah, they're they're really starting to pick things up. Uh, they're going after my friends on Twitter who are pro Donald Trump. Uh, they're going after anyone who says anything about Pizzagate or anyone nasty about CNN. But you know, we have these CNN leaks that are coming out, so people are starting to find out the truth if they go on the internet. Obviously, everything's not true on the internet, but you know, the stuff that you see on the mainstream media is just so heavily spun and censored. It's it's really amazing that they've gotten away with it for so long. But uh, yeah, so we're looking for contingency plans. We're also trying to raise capital for our educational technology company. I want to offer people a, a quality and affordable business and investor education at affordable price taught by experts so they can learn to adapt to you know the crazy things that are going on in the economy. And when one asset class is doing well, they can make money off that. Then when there's a bear market there, they can learn to transition to the next one. Well, I'll definitely put links to all of those resources in today's show note. Jason, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, and keep up the great work. Hi, this is MC Lobsher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining their capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested in learning more, you can email me at info at cashflowninja.com and I will send you a copy of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. 
Thank you for joining my guest, Jason Burak, and myself on the Cashflow Ninja today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes, and share our show with family, friends, and your network. I'm always trying to learn and improve in every area of my life, so if there's any way that I could provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. Jimmy Freeland and Bob Scott have been in your shoes and have used real estate investing to become financially free. They've designed a system to take any beginner to an experienced deal-making investor in the least amount of time. They offer opportunities from basic education, coaching, bridge loan investing to turnkey investments in the cash-flowing market of St. Louis, Missouri. For more information, please visit jointopsproperties.com or call Jimmy and Bob at 314 799 Two two four seven. Coffee is a proven product and a ninety billion dollar industry worldwide. Through international coffee farms, you have a chance to own and operate your own half acre parcels in a specialty coffee farm in Panama, professionally turnkey managed for you. You can download your coffee farm ownership opportunity report at cashflowninja.com forward slash Panama. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cash Flow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness. 